Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise for a point of personal privilege. The delegate has the floor. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, today I want to give um, the moment in black history. And we're going to talk a little bit about a group of people called Grio. The Grio was a member of traveling poets, musicians, and storytellers who maintained the tradition of oral history in parts of West Africa. A Grio, let me spell it, is G R I O T, pronounced Grio. They were responsible for keeping a record of all the births, all the deaths, all the marriages, all of the, throughout all the generations and the families and in villages, so that their stories would never be forgotten or lost. Sometimes they were known as advisors, as diplomats of the villages, someone who you could call on to intervene in different types of disputes. They are griots in other cultures also. They are also the keepers of family history and family secrets. They are family advisors. They are family storytellers. I ask you, who are the griots in your family? You know, in my family, it was my father. My father lived most of his life during our nation's darkest time, during Jim Crow. Can you imagine him trying to raise five little black children to grow up to be proud and uh, confident and, and uh, intelligent during this time when racism, discrimination, and segregation was just the way it was? But his wisdom, his common sense, his judgment, his discernment was second to none. He was a proud man who loved his family more than anything in this world. He was not a big man by statue. Some of you may remember me talking about him. But I'll tell you this, he had the deepest voice I have heard in my whole life. I remember as a young child, we would go to the drive-in movie theater. We really went there even when it wasn't a pandemic. But there was two lines, a line for black children, uh, black families, a line for the white families. And then once you went into the drive-in movie theater, there was a big fence going right along, dividing up the white side, the black side. But there was only one big screen. In the middle, right in front of the screen, there was a small playground with playground equipment, they had swings there. And children could go out there and play for a little while until the movie started. Well, my father knew I liked to swing and wanted to play on, this, on all of the equipment. He would take us down there, but we couldn't get on any of the equipment. And I couldn't understand why. Why can't we get on the swings? I wanted to swing so much. But my father knew that we couldn't get on the swing because if a white child wanted to get on the swing, we would have to get off. And I'm sure it just broke his heart, but what could he do at that time? He didn't want me to get on the swing and have to get off. So I just stood there and I watched as those little other children were out there swinging. And I can tell you today that that little black girl has never forgotten how it made her feel that day. My father knew how much we loved to swing. So on Sunday afternoons, he would take us to the park. I think Delegate Price knows this park, Pinky's Beach we used to call it, now it's King Lincoln. And that's where black children could go out there and swing as much as they wanted to swing. He took us there every Sunday afternoon and I can still hear the screech of those swings going back and forth. And we would stay out there and swing until the sunset. That was the best time in the summer to me. But I never forget how it felt to stand there and watch other little children swing. And we couldn't swing. So when I asked my father, why can't we get on the swing? Why can't all the other children just get on the swing? It was hard to explain. So he said to us at that time, that's just the way it is right now, baby. But I never forgot what else he said. And that booming voice, he said, let me tell you, we serve a mighty God who sits high and he looks low. He sees you, he loves you, and you are perfect just the way you are. And then he would always sing to us, and it's still my favorite Negro gospel song. 
Swing low, sweet chariot. Just something about swinging to me that I just love it. But you know, I wonder what he would say if he could see his little girl right now. That's not how the story ends. But well, we'll see with each passing year, and I got closer and closer and closer to me becoming my family's griot. So much of my history I shared with my sons and my grandchildren, and I can tell you one thing. I had three boys, and the first one was a grandson, and when I had that granddaughter, whew, she was the sun, the moon, and all of the stars, and the day when she was born, I knew this little girl would never feel the hurt that I had felt. So you know on her first birthday, you know what I bought for her? I bought her a swing. That Fisher Price little bucket kind of swing. I set her in that little swing and she just smiled with that first push I gave her and those chubby little legs were just kicking. She was having such a good time but she didn't know how much fun it was for me just to sit there and watch her swing knowing that she could swing as much as she wanted to swing and nobody was going to tell her to get off that swing. We kept a swing in our backyard for years until all of the grandchildren got a little bit older and they didn't think about swinging anymore. But I want to tell you about Kiara, the granddaughter. She was here in 2004 when I took my oath of office. She was right here. I want you to know now she's a sophomore majoring in marine biology at Hampton University. She's been on the dean's list every semester. But during this last finals, she stayed in that room all weekend long, studying so hard. And I had to tell her, Kiara, you got to come out. You got to come out. You got to eat sometime. When she finally came out, she said, Mima, I am just so tired. I wish you had that swing in your backyard. You know, stories matter. And she knew if she could get on that swing, everything would be made better. But I told her that that swing didn't mean what we thought it meant. She was already smart enough. She was already gifted. She was already good enough just the way she was. And that's when I realized myself that day on that swing. That swing never defined my worth. I was always good enough. Now, I tell you this story because I want you to remember how important it is to maintain our family's history. I want you to see, even though it's a little hard, for you to see a little glimpse inside my soul and what makes me work. You want me to vote for a bill of yours? Tell me about a swing. <laughs> you know, as I was writing in my moment in black history, I realized also something that I didn't recognize. You know, I'm the oldest African-American currently serving in this body. And maybe, just maybe, I might be standing in for our, as our griot. So I feel it is important that I tell you one of our truths, one a difficult truth, but it's an important truth. But I want you to think that it's important, that I believe it's important that the entire body know that many of us just cringe every time we hear that parents don't want their children's feelings to be hurt, to be told the truth about a part of our history. And I ask you, but what about the feelings of the little black children? who are not only hearing these stories, but they actually, actually face some of these types of discrimination. I don't think that there is a tip line set up for black parents when our children's feelings are hurt or they are harassed or they are bullied about the texture of their hair or the color of their skin, the size of their nose, the size of their lips, or where they live. No, I'm not talking about our children living in the 1950s and 1960s. I'm talking about our children living today, every single day in this commonwealth. We want you to know that black children's feelings can be hurt, and black children can cry. Yes, I just want to say this. I know we did not create this mess. None of us created this mess. But it's certainly up to this generation, it's up to us to begin to heal this commonwealth. 
And we could do this also by just sharing our family's histories. I've told you part of my history. I invite you to come tell me a part of yours because that's the only way we could truly see each other for who we really are. You know, some of these stories that you want teachers to tell in school, they should be taught to our children. After all, children, parents are our children's first teachers, the best teachers. Let them begin to learn these things before going to schools. There are books on every single level that talks about the history of this country. They even have a portion on Sesame Street that teaches children about diversity. So none of this should be brand new. Most of it should be taught right there at home. I think we should talk about the good and the bad, the secrets and the celebration, because that's who makes us who we are. Because I do believe that there are griots all in this body right now. You think about it. If you are the one who keeps the family secrets, if you know the family history, build on it. Make sure you tell your children, your grandchildren, don't let anything be a secret when they come to school. Mr. Speaker, ladies and gentlemen of this house, this has been my moment in black history. And as you can see, it's coming straight from the depth of my heart. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mm -hmm.